Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for touching us and not allowing us to remain the same, but to grow us deeper in our love for you and in our service one for another. I thank you for teaching us about intercessory prayer and for the needs of others that come our way that we can answer the call that you place upon us. Father, I thank you again for our friends that are with us today, for our church members, all of the birthdays that we're celebrating. And Father, I just ask that as we come now into the last quarter of this year, the, when, when the celebrations are taking place, may we always be reminded that you are our most honored guest. Holy Spirit, fill this hour with your power, with your love, that we may be bold enough through your guidance to love others and to pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood on the right hand.
arguments cease. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious from fever. And I've watched that little body grow quiet and the fevered brow cool. I've sat beside a dying saint, her body racked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it. Yet still it stands. And there shall be the final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound Every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one great mighty chorus to proclaim, to proclaim the name of Jesus. For in that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you see, it was not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to the virgin man, his name shall be called Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, there really is something about that name. beautiful choir thank you what theology there is there's something about that name didn't Dustin do good too he did I don't know about you but I saw a sign down at the watering hole and I even got it on my phone right here you know what that sign said it said frog parking only all others will be towed. <laughs> I just had to share that with you. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's start right off with history today. All right. In 1991, Lee Atwater was the man most responsible for electing George H.W. Bush president. That was in 1988. Well, back then, Lee was 39 years old. He was on top of the world. Then he developed a, a massive brain tumor. He had it treated, but the more treatment that he had, the worse it became. And shortly before he died, Life magazine published an article in which Lee had evaluated his life. And we were thinking about all the hymns that Shirley's picked out for us about, about Jesus saving us and being our Savior. And there's just something about that name, Jesus. Lee Atwater said this, The 80s were about acquiring wealth, power, prestige. I know. I acquired 
more wealth, power, and prestige than most. But you can acquire all you want and still feel empty. What power wouldn't I trade for a little more time with my family? What price wouldn't I pay for an evening with a friend? It took a deadly disease to put me eye to eye with that truth. But it is a truth that the country caught up in all of its ruthless ambitions and moral decay can learn on my dime. I don't know who will lead us through the 90s, but they must be made to speak to this spiritual vacuum in the heart of American society. It's the tumor of our soul. Lee Atwater passed away March 29th, 1991, only 40 years old. But back in the 80s, no one had heard of Bill Clinton. No one had heard of Britney Spears. Back in the 80s, O.J. Simpson was still an American hero. No one knew of Timothy McVeigh. No one knew of Columbine High School. And these events all occurred in the 1990s. Is there still a spiritual vacuum in the hearts of American society? Beloved, I, I tend to think so. I think that's why we're so restless. I think that's why we're, we're so striving and reaching and trying to find something that can just bring us lasting joy. And you know, you're not going to find it till you come to Jesus. Amen. Till you come to Jesus. See, earthly wants create spiritual vacuums in our hearts. And the answer is Jesus, simply Jesus. So in our Bible reading today, in our scripture passage, we're going to come across a young man. Well, some people say, well, he's called a rich young ruler. So I don't really have to pay attention because I don't have the money like a rich young ruler. I don't either, but I had to put my toes underneath the pew when I got to reading this and studying this. It's not about being rich. It's about our priorities. What is it that we are clinging to, that we hold on to, that keeps us from totally being dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ? We'll find out from the rich young man and how that applies to us today. The Bible doesn't say how he became wealthy. He's just already on the scene wealthy, but he's still empty. He, he seems to be pretty religious. He knows the Ten Commandments as being his way of life. He's trying to do the right thing, but something is still missing. And so he has a talk with Jesus. And that's where Matthew has us right now. Let's look at the Word of God, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, 17. Please take the Bible there in front of you if you didn't bring yours this morning. And let's look together. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 and 17. Now, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher? See, notice he didn't say Lord. He didn't say Savior. Teacher. Doesn't know him on a personal level. What good thing must I do? Notice that. I do. What must I do to get eternal life? Jesus, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. So look at verse 16 a minute. He had it all materialistically. And now he wants to add eternal life as an accomplishment to his list. Sounds like he's, he's heading in the right direction. We, we can admire his courage, his honesty in coming to Jesus. He, in the New Testament, this young man would be considered climbing upward on the ladder. 
But what young man climbing the ladder socially would have time for an itinerary minister from Galilee? I mean, after all, Jesus didn't even have a church he preached from. He just went from place to place and did a lot of his preaching and teaching underneath trees or out on the, out on the water or down by the rocks, out on a mountain. What young man would look to someone like this? But yet, he, he seemed to ask the right question. Lord, tell me what you want me to do. Jesus already pointed out that salvation does not come from good deeds. Beloved, I want you to hear that. There are many religions today that says you can work and do and earn your salvation. You can work and you can do and you can earn higher levels of heaven. That's not true. That's not true. There's only one way to heaven. And that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no other way. Jesus said there's no other way to the Father except through whom? The Son. The Son. This rich young man needed a new outlook on life. Look at verse 17. Jesus answered, well, why do you call me good? Now, remember, most of the places where Jesus is going... And every time he's preaching and teaching, there are crowds of people around him. And in the midst of that crowd are the Pharisees, the little nitpickers, you know. They're just looking for something to get Jesus about, to trip Jesus up on, to point at Jesus, you aren't obeying the Ten Commandments. You aren't listening to the, to the five books of the laws of Moses. So Jesus, right there in the midst of all of these people, Ask, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. What is Jesus telling us? What was he telling this young man? Jesus means that all true goodness comes from God. Jesus is saying that I am not merely a good person. It's because I am God in the flesh. Do you really know who you're talking to? That's what he's saying. Beloved, it's not God's first, then Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit. It's all one. And it's so powerful that he can manifest himself to us in three different ways. As our Heavenly Father, as our Savior in the flesh. He came down into the flesh so that we could relate to him and hear him. And now he carries us forward every day through the indwelling of his spirit. We call that the Holy Spirit. Our conscience doesn't guide us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's guiding us and leading us to honor Jesus in all the places that we go and all the things that we say and do. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm not just a good person. I am God in the flesh in your presence. That's who you're talking to. Beloved, every time you and I get down on our knees and pray or sitting in a chair and pray or standing up and pray, it is to this good God that we're praying to. Listen to what else goes on. Look at verse 18. This rich young man with all this wealth before him asked Jesus, which one? Which one of these commandments am I supposed to keep? Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. See, these, these two verses are really the fulfillment of Exodus 20 beginning at verse 12, where the Lord gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And Jesus here in, in verse 19, he lists six of the Ten Commandments. These are the ones that are dealing with human relationships. The first four deal with our relationship to God. 
The other six deal with our relationship to each other. Don't kill each other. Don't murder each other. Don't commit adultery among yourselves. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. And remember, we've learned now already that our neighbor, based on the Greek, isn't the person that lives beside us or across from us or back behind us. The word neighbor means the person standing beside us. So not only are we brothers and sisters in Christ, but right now, according to the Greek, you and I are neighbors. We are with each other. And that's who we are to treat these, what, this way. You ever wonder, though, why did Jesus choose these six? Well, because, you see, the, this rich young man is asking for his to-do list. What do you want me to do? Jesus does not quote from the first part of the, of the Ten Commandments, as we said, as our relationship with God. But he quoted these, these two portions here, this, this la the second portion here. Why did he do that? Well, let's look on in what the Scriptures have to say for us. Let's look at verse 20. The rich young man said, Well, all these I've kept. What do I still lack? Beloved, you hear that? Doing still creates a vacuum. It still creates emptiness. It's not about what we do. It's about the relationship we're in with Jesus Christ. Jesus answered him in verse 21. If you want to be perfect, uh oh, that's a big word, isn't it? I'm, I'm perfect. I can make a mess all by myself. Don't need no help in that, you know? Don always asks me, can I help you? I know, nope, I can make a mess all by myself. Don't need any help making that mess. If you want to be perfect, here's what you got to do. Go sell your possessions and give them to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Well, he got his to-do list. So how did he respond? Verse 22. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. When, when the young man, I think, replied that, that he had kept all of these, I, Jesus guided him, moved him to a deeper truth. And that, that's what Jesus is always going to be doing with us. We're, we're never the same once we encounter Jesus because he takes us and helps us to see where we are and where he wants us to be. He said to this young, rich young man, sell everything you have and give it to the poor because Jesus knew this was his weak point. His, his wealth had become his God, it, his, his graven image. And, and he wouldn't give it up. Therefore, by not giving up his wealth, in this case, he violated the first of the great commandments. You'll have no other gods before me. Well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, you know, let's, let's think a minute. That word, verse 21, that phrase, be perfect, it's not talking about temporal human sense. It's not talking about being right, always being correct, although many of us think that we are. <laughs> Jesus is talking with him about, and when you see it in the Bible about being perfect, it's about being justified, being saved, being made complete in God's sight. And the way that you and I become complete, justified, the way that we become saved in God's eye is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our very own Savior and Lord. Nothing that you can do. There's no political office that we can hold. There, there, there's no little committee office that we can do. There's nothing we can do in the community that ranks higher than believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Is Jesus saying that all believers, you and us, all of us here today, to go and sell everything that we own? No. We are responsible to take care of our needs. 
we are responsible to take care of the needs of our families. And we are responsible to take care of anyone else that the Lord brings before us. Should believers be willing to give up anything if God asks us to do? Yes. This type of attitude allows nothing to come between us and God. Beloved, here's what we need to ask ourselves right now. What are we holding on to that's too difficult for us to let go of? Well, yeah, but what about, bud? I, I, I can't let go. Well, what about such and Beloved, we hold on to our wealth. Do we hold on to, to the importance of being recognized? Do we hold on to the need to be in control? Do we hold on to memory? Are we holding on to a, a loss? All of these attitudes can have a way of turning us away from God and focusing us on ourselves. And that's where our problem arises so much from ourselves. Do we need a new outlook today? If we do, let's come to Jesus. Look at verse 22. When the young man heard what Jesus had said, what did he do? He went away sadly. He had great wealth. And see, I think that this is the only verse that I can think of where somebody walked away from Jesus. And what did Jesus not do? Jesus didn't go chasing after him. He did not go chasing after this rich young ruler. He was sorrowful. He walked away from Jesus. Now, what does this have to say to us? How does it take this and apply it to where we are today? Always remember that little recipe. Say, mean, say. What does the Bible say? Read the words. What does it mean? You might get a commentary to help you. And what does it say to me in my life today? Say, mean, say. Let's see what it says to us now. All right, let's go to verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, well, Can you imagine the eyes of Jesus on you? Jesus says, With man this is impossible, but with God all things. Are possible. Look at verse 24. When Jesus says the eye of the needle, that's, that's what he means. When he's talking about the camel, that's what he means here. Let's do a little cultural lesson in verse 25. See, the disciples are confused. Who then can be saved? See, their society believed that because you're rich, that you're really blessed by the Lord, and the Lord's hand is, is upon you. And so if Jesus is saying that this rich young man can't get to heaven because he turned away, then who in the world can be saved? We praise the Lord that these men, these disciples, were willing to have their attitude adjusted. Would we be willing to have our attitude adjusted? I don't need my attitude adjusted. I'm fine just the way I am. Well, we think that way. We may be more like the rich young ruler than we really tend to want to give credit for it. Verse 26. It's impossible for a rich person to go to heaven. No. No. Jesus explained with God, all things are possible. Even rich people can go to heaven. Anybody can go to heaven as long as they believe in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. It's that simple. It's just that simple. See, wealth is the illustration. The important part is the attitude. The wealth was just the vehicle that, that Jesus was using to show, to show the crowds. Beloved, entering into heaven is only by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have to ask ourselves, are we clinging to something in our life 
that's keeping us from being fully committed, fully coming forth. There's, there's no debating with Jesus. Receiving the reward of heaven through faith in him and that there is no other way which leads us into verse 27. Let's pick up there. Peter. <laughs> oh, Peter. Don't we just love Peter? He's always the first one to come up with a question, the first one to come up with, with a statement. He takes a stand. May not be the, the accurate stand, but at least he took a stand for Jesus. P Peter, Peter gives me hope. You, you, you heard of that, what do you call that disease? Foot and mouth disease? Mm-hmm. I, I tend to have that. You hear me sometimes say, well, I'll get back with you on that because I'm going to run by what I'm going to say to Donna before I come out with you for work. <laughs> oh. Peter answered him, we have left everything. See, they were holding on to their business, the fishing, the nets, the fish. We, we've left it all to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, that is proof of his return. That is proof of his kingdom established here on earth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne... You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But, that means slow down. But many who are first, see, he's talking about all those Pharisees there and amongst them there. They, they, they got their chest puffed out. Who think that they're first will be last. And many who are last, thinking you've given up everything, you're going to get to be first. See, God gives rewards to his people according to his justice, not our accomplishments. As believers, our true and lasting reward is God's presence and power through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, I'd whole lot rather have the Holy Spirit than have an earthly reward. See, later in eternity, we will be rewarded for our faith and service. See, now we're having blessings. Every day we live is a blessing. We have the love of family and friends and church. That's blessing. But when we die and we're in heaven with the Lord, then we're going to get our reward. And that's up to God to give to us then. But why do we have to wait? Why can't I get my reward now? I'd like to have it right now. Well, just think about this. Think about the Hurricane Helene Relief. And all that we collected and all that we gave out. If we were rewarded immediately right now on earth, it, we would tend to boast about what we have done and what we've accomplished. And you know what? That would just ruin our witness. I don't want to hear about what you've done. You don't want to hear about what I've done. I want to hear about what Jesus has done through us. That's where we want to focus. Verse 29. Jesus assured his disciples that anyone who gives up something valuable for his sake will be repaid many times over and not necessarily in the same format that we're thinking about. Just imagine if, if a person is rejected by their family for accepting Christ, then that believer will gain the larger family of believers that he can have and she can have her own. Beloved, I want to be rewarded by God. God's way, not the earth's way. Verse 30 is our application. Verse 30 is our hope today. Look at verse 30. Through faith in Jesus Christ, 
in our life to come, the last will be first. Jesus is telling us, do not forfeit your eternal rewards for temporary benefits. Believers will be willing to accept man's disapproval for God's approval. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to live your life to love God. That's through worship. I want you to live your life to love others. That's through discipline and discipling and learning and growing together. And I want you to serve Jesus in the world today. And that's through missions outreach. When you hear a call for help, I want you to answer it. I want you to answer it. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for just giving us the privilege that we have right now. That we may be at the point where the one thing that we need is a life transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. It's ours for the asking. Holy Spirit, open our heart. Open our heart. And Jesus will come in. Father, forgive us for loving our outlook in life so much so that we really haven't got much more room for you to grow us. May we repent of holding on and clinging and grasping. Being filled with the Spirit begins this first way. Simply admit that you've never believed in Jesus. And you repent. You're sorry that you never believed. And today, right now, you admit that you have committed that sin. And today you believe that your sin is forgiven. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross and rose from the grave. And by faith in Him, you believe that you'll be in heaven. And now on this day, you want to commit your life to serving Jesus. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to walk down here and meet with me. And we'll spend a moment in prayer. But Christian brothers and sisters, being comforted and being filled with the Holy Spirit gives us confidence to rededicate, to give, to let go of our Christian outlook so that it is all about Jesus and not about debating Him and, and trying to figure things out ourselves, but to say, all to Him I give. You come and recommit your life to Jesus we pray now in his very strong and humbling name. Amen. You come meet with me down front.